So most people will tell you that they dislike standardization and they like diversity. But they also like going to a McDonald's anywhere in the whole world and being able to order a Big Mac and a French fries and essentially have the same product. That's standardization. They, are, they think that they're pro-diversity, but once again, if you, they want to go to a McDonald's and they want to order the same thing, they want to be able to get the same Nike shoes, the same from, from probably, the, probably the same factory in some cases, but with a different branding, um, they want that, all of that together. And in fact, the reason they're able to get a Nike shoe all over the world is because a lot of these processors have become standard all over the world in a combination of software expertise and hardware expertise that is increasingly, because it has become so homogenous, it's been able to be narrowed down into an algorithm that then can be done anywhere in the world. So what I think what people actually mean is they want, rand they want some randomness and they know that standard as a standard, being standard is, is the same thing as being a conformist, but they also like convenience. So you have this constant battle between the idea of excessive differences and this other idea that you want to have some differences because otherwise things would simply get boring. And in fact, in every advanced society today, in any country that has an, an, an technology dominant, do, just sort of dominant within that economy, there, uh, there, there typically ends up having fewer births as well as higher suicides. And that isn't obviously only attribu no, attributed to higher or advanced technology. But if we look at technology, of course, there's a high cost of living and so on. But if you look at technology as increasing standardization uh, and therefore reducing the individual, you can see why people are intuitively against it. If you think of diversity, I guess my point is we, we want to think about diversity a little bit differently. Because in fact, if you do go to a McDonald's in Mexico, you get, you know, at least when I went there a while ago, you could get avocado on your, on your Big Mac. And that was, I had that every day. In fact, if you go to, and get a Coca-Cola in a glass bottle in Mexico, it's manufactured by the bottling plant FEMSA there, it's just made with real sugar. So it is different. It's the same company, but it's different. It's the same, you know, sort of, it's a, not really the same, fat, you know, the same owner, right? Because FEMSA, this is the bottling company, is a different. So it's, it's the same sort of overall structure, but it's still separate. And that's why it's allowed to be a little bit different within that structure. Um, that eventually goes all the way back to, I believe, Atlanta, Georgia. Now, what I think people, when they look at diversity, they, what they're really, you know, complimenting, um, what, what's really complimentary or something that's aspirational is the result of randomness, right? Something that's, say, half someone who's half Indonesian and half Japanese, that takes effort. That's, that's, that's something that tells you that segregation is not something that has been enforced completely. Whereas, remember, the point of something being standardized is to make everything the same. If you, in order to reduce in order to increase quality control and to reduce mistakes. And what's, what's really interesting is that, you know, in the past, we used to think of people that were, you know, we, we didn't want, we actually, in, in some, some places, especially places that um, did not outlaw slavery, um, or at least converted the system of indentured servitude into chattel slavery, there was something called miscegnation, essentially, you know, anti-mixing. Um, and of course, that's that's a very you don't, you don't get that word, right? Because if you look at that, if, if there's not, if there's not something some antipathy towards diversity, but again, most of us are pro diversity. We don't want to be the same. And what I think what what we really mean is that we want something that's that's consistent in quality. So in other words, we're for standardization if it leads to consistent quality. And we sort of assume that if we're able to standardize all these processes and put it into an algorithm, that we're going to be able to have the same shoe, the same quality, or anything really, the same food. You know, you can see how this would overlap into many, many different industries, not just food and, 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 and you know, clothing or shoes. So once the problem with all this is that 
it's it's you know a situation where standardization typically once you achieve it makes people i don't want to say lazy that's not the right word but it, it reduces randomness and in doing so it actually increases all the things we dislike like in other words it replicates in the abstract through a software code things like segregation and it actually reduces things like you know you can't inject randomness into an algorithm um at least even if you could it wouldn't be the kind of thing that you would that would be spontaneous or that would really lead to anything meaningful because all it's, all the algorithm is really doing is trying to create different scenarios it's not actually a process of something that's random because the whole point of an algorithm is to predict something that's going to happen in the future replicate it in order to remove uncertainty so if we think about the whole world um, as a, a, a situation where we want standardization, but only if it improves quality. And we actually, when we think about diversity, what we really mean it, uh, is some sort of tangible evidence uh, that randomness exists in our lives. And once again, the problem is that if you have too much randomness, if, if things get, you know, if you end up going to a McDonald's and it's all completely different, uh, everywhere you go, and the menu is not not the same. It's not even in the same, you know. Diff it's not in multiple languages, um, and so on. And by the way, one way to think about corporations is, is multinational corporations is, is that they're, they're delivery vehicles, not for the product, but for the culture and the language. Uh, that then facilitates, in, in some cases, a greater understanding between two countries. And that actually is sort of the the, the origin of the McDonald's hypothesis, which is which is actually false. The idea that um, not true, which is the idea that countries that, that have had, you know, enough, both countries with two McDonald's um, have never gone to war against each other. And of course, I think a month after that, that theory, that, that power hypothesis came out, you know, there was a war somewhere right around Bosnia, I believe. Um, but you can see that, that there's clearly an, an, an intuitive allure to that idea, but we should understand why. And what's really happening today in, in, our, in 2020 is we, ha we, we are moving towards a world where we don't appreciate randomness because it's, li it's, it's the costs have gone up. Um, you know, instead of having a, a randomness dealing with a knife or a sword, now you're dealing with a, a, an automatic machine gun um, or just an automatic gun. So, the, so what you're looking at, again, is, is when you have excessive randomness, you end up having you know, sort of more acceptance of authoritarianism, which of course, is really this idea that you want more standardization, which then goes back into all these political debates about federalism, how much, how much really, you know, how much do you really want to let cities and localities experiment, you know, under the Brandeis model? Um, and, and how much you know, power do you want the central government to have in order to not have a system where we have, you know, a currency being issued by each state or by each province that, you know, may not be interchangeable completely or at, at a reasonable rate of exchange. And when we think about all these things, and, and, and basically because of the horrors of, of World War, actually it's not just not just Second World War, but of course all the wars that happened before then, there were so many wars. I think the Thirty Years' War, I mean there's so many of them killed so many millions of people as well, but you just don't know about them uh, because we haven't studied them. You know, most people only study one country's history, they don't study, it's just too much time to go in and try to study Chinese history, Russian history, and European history. Um, and you won't be able to get anything more than a superficial understanding. But it is important to get sort of an overall understanding about where the direction that humanity is leading um, itself into. Um, and of course, these, these debates are nothing new. If you go back and, you know, humanity philosophers have always warned against excessive technology. Um, the argument, the foundation of the argument being that it reduces the individual. But again, I think that's all wrong. Uh, it actually promotes the individual to the, to the extent that quality goes up, to the extent that the roads are perfectly fine and, and you know, that there are roads. And because you standardize the situation, you're, you're, you can give more, you can produce more roads because standardization leads to lower costs and therefore greater adoption. And this is, I think, a scene from you know, a movie in Hollywood, a very old one where, you know, essentially, you know, you didn't have anything there before, now you've got a road, you can, once you have a road, you can build, you can build a building there because people, it's now accessible, whereas before it wasn't. So all these things are standardized in order to, you know, not only promote, promote quote unquote development, which, to the, which is problematic because it's a paradox. The, the more that, the cheaper these materials get, the more it becomes standardized and the more it, it, easier it is to adopt, which then makes everything the same, which, 
is weird because like I said, we all want diversity. But that's not, But what we really want is randomness. In other words, if the sameness puts us into a, a level of reasonable randomness, in other words, if ha you know, nobody really complains about all the roads being the same, because it's, it, makes it, it, it increases the chances of meeting someone else, right? Or creating a different environment, putting yourself into a different environment, and then therefore getting that, that randomness injected into your life. And what, what, what we think about when we want new experiences, a lot of it is that desire innately for some sort of randomness, which is, you know, which is sort of the foundation of, of innovation, quite frankly. Um, you know, coffee, of course, the famous one. Um, and, you know, it, it, but it's, it's so much more. And I think if you really look at science, I just tried to read a paper um, published by Stephen Hawking about parallel universes. I couldn't understand more than two sentences out of the 16 page um, uh, uh, treatise. So well, it's article. Now, what's what's interesting is that th that to me tells me that scientists don't really. And if you actually talk to scientists, you know, everything is, you know, sort of a, a hypothesis constantly. You once, once in a while you get a theory that, uh, but you know, that, that can actually be perfectly um, sort of defended. But for the most part, science is just like everything else. It's, it's, it's simply, you know, it's, it, it's, it's constantly being tested um, because, you know, again, randomness, um, especially if there are parallel universes, um, it means that you're never going to find the right answer. And so that's where people... That's why you have perfectly smart people on on the one side of, of faith, which is the exact opposite of evidence-based, you know, thinking, and the, on the other side you've got, of course, Dawkins and everyone else, where um, you have again, you know, the evidence-based thinking in science, um, and, and even though you have these polar opposites in, in fact gathering, um, you can see that you know clearly having two people, you know, or at least multiple people on both sides being ex extremely intelligent tells you that there has to be something that, that unites them. And what I'm telling you is that that, that unification factor is randomness. Um, and, in, and in fact, people like Carl Sagan and Dawkins are in fact um, successful precisely because they, they acknowledge this. The whole point is that what we see out there that, you know, tells us, number one, that we're quite insignificant, which is actually the same thing that religion says. Religion says, submit yourselves before this greater power. Um, and, you know, of course, it can be manipulated in the same way that science can, that nuclear energy can. Um, and so you actually see two methods in terms of the most successful scientists. You, and quite frankly, evolution. What is evolution but this idea that of, of randomness, you know, sort of interacting with the, with the environment in an in organic way. If you think about all these things together, what, what really should come to mind, again, is we want standardization to the extent that it lowers costs, but only if it improves quality and randomness. You put that factor in there, it changes the whole discussion, I think. Now, let's talk about this. How do you unite these two groups, right? Which are which clearly have a lot of overlap. You know, they, Carl Sagan and, and, and Dawkins, you know, they, they have this beautiful way of, of, of weaving together a story um, that's still fact based, but, but when you really boil it down, a lot of it is, you know, this idea that, that you can't really know, right, what, what, what's, what, what the future holds. And in fact, that's one of the best movies ever made, um, Back to the Future. You know, the, the sort of conclusion, uh, once you've discovered time travel, is that even if, if you have discovered it, the future is unwritten. So all these things are actually cause for optimism. And people like Sagan and Dawkins and people within that sort of line of thinking, scientific thinking, that's the, that's the secret. That's to, to their success, that, that their appealability, uh, their appeal, sorry, is that you have this idea that of overlapping between all these different you know fields of of, of thinking, so it, it got me thinking about this other thing I saw today. This this discussion thirty years ago about uh, with Thomas Stoll, um, who S O W E L L, uh, who's at Stanford, probably one of the greatest economic thinkers alive, uh, happens to be black, um, and he was on this panel uh, with Milton Friedman, and he, they were discussing, and he was actually discussing. The issue of, of well affirmative action sort of race-based affirmative action um with a well-meaning white liberal female and what what you see here is that you have this idea of very clearly that you know where these people are, are are why they're disagreeing on the one hand you have somebody of course a liberal argument in that case would be on that topic would be that you know you, you cannot simply have a society based on on pure merit because of 
you know, people don't start at the same place in the starting line in the race. Um, and of course you have this other side with Thomas Sowell. Well, actually, let me finish that argument. And the other, other argument is actually that we can't rely on outliers. So it's Thomas Sowell, you've made it. Clarence Thomas, you've made it. Um, but that cannot be, the outliers cannot be the basis for a standardized or, you know, any kind of plan that would allow us to improve the quality of life overall in a way that maintains or improves consistency, consistent results while improving quality. And you can see Sol, and at one point she says, well, you know, there's, there's a clearly, you know, what we need to do is, is, is fix the problem of, I mean, she, she focuses on, it's a racial discussion, she focuses on race, right? And, and when talking about, we need to improve, the, you know, the, essentially the racial situation for African Americans. And this, of course, sets off Thomas Sowell, um, who is, you know, extremely intelligent and it's probably worked hard or twice as hard to get to where he is. And of course, the argument on the, on the so-called conservative side is that, you know, you have to earn, you, know, you have to have a society that's based on merit. That has to be the guiding principle. Uh, basically, consistency combined with quality has to be the way forward. Uh, and what you're complaining about on the other side is this randomness that you want to sort of smooth over, um, but it's not going to work. And, 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 you know, it's simply not going to work because if you sort of give somebody something that's not based on merit, you're essentially condescending to them. And if there's one thing that a smart person doesn't like, it's just that, it's that condensation, that, that's just sort of that attitude. And it occurred to me that, you know, the gap can be resolved simply by history. And I never liked history until I, I realized that it's the only thing that's going to get us on the same page uh, in terms, because what really unites all of us is, is the ability to tell stories. The Bible, of course, is a story. Uh, everything's a story. Uh, you know, it's just how you say it and, and what context and, and how many contexts is, or how can tell, well, the quality of the context is really what, what should matter. And quite frankly, the more diversity you have, you have to improve the number and quality of storytellers, otherwise you end up with excessive fragmentation, which then leads to authoritarianism or an accept a greater acceptance of that. And so in this case, you know, what, what, what had, had the, the white liberal simply said that what we need to do is, is try to standardize e equality of opportunity for poor people. Uh, and be in the United States, because of slavery, because of this historical, you know, sort of, um, economic acceptance, this method, actually the way to argue against Thomas Sowell would have been, well, you know, everything you're saying is true, um, but in reality, you know, as you know, you know, people in power tend to try to try to get work done for them at the lowest possible cost. And slavery in the Western Hemisphere was, it was a form of chattel slavery. It was not something that considered the whole human being. And so what ended up happening in the Western Hemisphere as a result of, you know, say a, a papal bull or a papal decree that allowed slavery to last quite, quite, a, quite a bit longer than, um, you know, slavery was able to survive in other places in the world, especially not chattel slavery. Uh, you have a system that, you know, an economic system that has favored a scenario disadvantaging poor people and concentrating wealth. And it just so happens in the U.S. because of that system, of that history, that there's a huge overlap between, you know, between poverty and race. And in fact, slavery, uh, for, you know, for the most part, uh, it's not the slavery itself, the, 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 the goal, the sort of aim at lowering wages, in this case, to zero, um, as much as you possibly could in order to maximize, you know, not just profit, but exports, but influence. Remember, all trade is just, just a conduit for influence. Um, and which then facilitates the issuance of debt and so on, um, and international influence as well, and, and language and so on. So um, you can look at Thomas Sowell and say that, so when, once you look at, look at it from a historical framework, the real question is, you know, is not whether we both want to help the African-American community, the real question is, because the system in place has disadvantaged so many people, in particular African-Americans, the question is, what policies do we need to help standardize the equality of opportunity. And not that we're ever gonna get there because we still want randomness. The real question is how do we get there in a way that's cost effective as much as possible? Um, you know, while, while continuing to use your, your lodestar of merit, which is not applicable in every situation, right? Because once again, um, you know, it's, it's not a situation where we can overcome those financial differences overnight. And that, that, I think, Thomas Sowell would probably, would, I don't know, you, you couldn't, he couldn't react the way he did. And he actually got upset. Not something you see very, very, very often with Mr. With Professor Sowell. 
Um, and Sowell's argument at that point would be, that's fine. I, I don't know what he would say, actually. But he probably would say, that's fine. But, you know, what you need to do is reform the structural problems that um, underpin poverty. And then, see, now you've got a way forward. And if slavery was the problem back then, then maybe you need to have a system in place that tries to either... And this is where the where conservatives and the Republicans, you can see how in, in the United States, why they focus on the family so much, right? Because slavery, of course, separated people, uh, treated them like chattel and not human beings uh, in the United States and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and in doing so, just had no, no issue with separating families, in fact, breeding people um, in order to you know, create a, <clears throat> a physically fit individual, I guess. Um, and this is, of course, the largest business in the United States and the most profitable one in the in the 18 either the first half I believe the first half of the 1800s so you have a system in place um, that you know you have to overcome and the question is you know how do you do it <clears throat> and I think Sowell would look at it in, in the sense that you can't change it in any they, they would be on the same page because of history because of this of this content contextual storytelling and you can see overall that really laws don't matter, the rule of law, you hear that all the time. Well, you know, America is successful because of the rule of law. No, it's the storytelling, it's what kind of storytelling happens. Because if you have a jury system, you evaluate the facts that come to you and the credibility of the witnesses that come to you, even if you, if you even manage to get to the jury, by the way, which is only about 5% of the cases, um, if you manage to get there, then you're in a position where, you know, it, this, the facts that are told to you as well as the credibility all comes through the, the lens a lens that has been either corrupted by or, you know, sort of cleared by, you know, many, many different contextual um, stories. And, of course, racism is simply, or, you know, prejudice in many cases is simply, um, you know, being told a story that's very, that's true, but only, but without, but out of context. Um, and so you can see all these, you know, sort of different things where it's really what's, what keeps humanity alive, civilizations alive, are true stories that involve context, as well as this goal towards consistency based on quality, which maintains a sufficient level of randomness, which tells you that humanity hasn't been locked down by somebody, by somebody who's completely authoritarian, that there's this informal system in place that allows you know, diversity by organically, not by fiat. Not by the way people did it back then in, say, the United States, where they bred the most physically fit people because they really did think a cotton and fit manual labor would be the future economy for the next hundred years, which was the only reason they did that. Um, and they were able to, of course, do that and treat people that way because of prejudice and, you know, and racism. So when you put them all together, you actually see that the foundation um, of civilization is actually contextual storytelling, uh, which some people might call empathy, but I, I don't. I don't actually think it's empathy. I, I actually think it's, it's simply because you can have a civilization like imagine the Vulcans, right? Without much empathy, if, if if indeed you're able to have enough facts that create humility, and then at that point create this quest or that drive forward this quest for standardization, standardization to the extent you know that it creates a certain kind of society, and then randomness to the extent that it also you know leads to um, a greater understanding or really a reflection back at you in terms of possibilities um, that tell you all, that also reflect upon you you know what what is might be possible in a small area and in fact one of the biggest problems is because human beings are so visual uh, we look at say one story and then we extrapolate that when in fact what we really ought to be doing is, is sort of the Brandeis model that I mentioned earlier uh, which is you know you have these cities as laboratories so you really need to look at cities themselves, not not states and so on. Um, but of course, that that conflicts with the direction we're going because you know all these investments, you know, a lot of them the secure just the security on them um, because they're so abstract and so digital, as opposed to being analog and tangible. Uh, the, the the costs are increasing. I'm not sure if it's exponentially, but um, you know, a bank these days, a major one, may need may spend nine billion dollars on technology, part of which is security, a year. Um, so obviously you're at a point where standardization has to occur on some level um, in, you know, in order to facilitate that cost structure. And really what Sowell and, and the white liberal are arguing back then is really the differences in cost in order to standardize equality of opportunities. Um, and how do you get there along with job opportunities? And of course the liberal will look at that and say, what about affirmative action? And, and that's where you get into, you know, you're sort of, 
it's a bit of a circle, a bit of a paradox in some in some cases. Um, but at least if we have the right story to tell, you know, we can look at it and try to figure out a better sense of direction, uh, so that we can. And, and one way to get that sense of direction, you know, standardized uh, in the quest, you know, in, in, in a way that positions it towards quality, is to look at diversity as randomness. Um, and to look at consistency as uh, standardization as good, but only to the extent that it allows greater randomness. So that when you go to a McDonald's in Mexico, you get that you can get that avocado. The standardization in, in the United States has not disrupted the ability of that city or that distant distant locality to innovate and to be different. So I hope that makes sense. And when I do these sort of things, and I'm just talking to myself. Um, but I'm talking to myself because um, I'm still trying to figure out all these ideas like everyone else. And if anyone tells you they've got all the answers, they're all wrong. Um, and, and so the, the real, you know, I know I'm very long-winded, um, but I think that it, there, there are solutions. There are better ways of doing things, uh, and there are less better ways of doing things. And I think a lot of these, a lot of the problem is the language. Not only the fact that, you know, we can't, we don't want to all speak the same language, so we just have to try harder to do better, a better job of translating, uh, but also we have to do a better job of, of translating what we're trying to say in our own language in order to be able to, to reduce the divide when we open our mouths. And one way to do that, of course, used to be philosophy, but if you open a paper with Stephen Hawking, it's written by Stephen Hawking, and you only understand two lines of it, uh, it tells you that science is not the answer, it's not going to be the answer. Um, and the real question is whether philosophy, and it's not gonna be law either, remember, because law is driven by the media, or what we see, and if what we see is false, and if what we see is a, is a product of standardization, or, or whatever gets the most clicks, you can see that the law is, is going to lose credibility, has lost credibility actually, um, especially the jury-based system. <sighs> so I guess we gotta keep moving forward as best as we can.